devastating indictment of our government and of our society. And because of the humiliation and shame, I could never tell my four children my true feelings about that event in 1942. I wait the uh, evacuation with rape. My own children don't know that my brother was shot in the back. You may never see him again. In 48 hours, we were told to pack up and leave. No, this is not democracy. This is democracy. Where one horse was housed, though we were three families. Four and a half years before I would see any of them again. This inhumane, cruel treatment and happening took place in the good old United States and not in Gestapo, Germany. Hard to believe, isn't it? We were informed that our baby had passed away. We performed a tubal ligation on her. Shortly thereafter, would you believe it? I was placed on the deportation list. My blood was burning with agony and frustration. I was so disgusted I request for deportation to Japan. I have not seen my father since I was here. So hi everyone again. Uh, thank you for joining us and for watching our slideshow and video clip. Uh, my name is Songdi. I'm part of staff at East Wind. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about East Wind before we get started. Uh, East Wind Books of Berkeley is a community bookstore. Uh, we're in downtown. Berkeley, and we specialize in Asian American and ethnic studies literature. Uh, we've been around for a little more than 30 years, and we hope to continue to keep serving our community for much longer. Um, so the trailer we just watched was a commission on wartime relocation and internment of civilians. Um, there, it was a hearings co-produced, and it was co-produced by NCRR and the Visual Communications, and the clips were edited by Steve Nagano. Uh, so if you missed it, don't worry, we will be showing an extended version of the video at the end of our program. So stick around for that. Um, so we're so excited to have John and Patricia with us today. Um, I think it's going to be a wonderful conversation. We're excited to hear what they say and also to answer any of your questions you might have. Um, but before we start, I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies Library. And today we have a very special uh, guest to share a few words on the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I'd like to welcome Sina, the Ethnic Studies Librarian, to say a few words. Hi, everyone. All right, unmuted, okay, good. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you so much, Songi, and, and to Eastwin. Um, to Erica, Janie, B, Harvey, thank you for bringing this from what was going to be a physical event in the Ethnic Studies Library to now the virtual world. So thank you for your um, perseverance in that. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I wandered into the Heyday Books office one day and met Julie there, who told me about the book. And um, since I heard about it, I would, became very excited. Um, so I'm the librarian for Asian American Studies uh, and Comparative Ethnic Studies at the Ethnic Studies Library. We have two other librarians who do Native American Studies and Chicano Studies. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt from a statement that we wrote um, in support of the Movement for Black Lives. We celebrated our 50th anniversary last year, um, and we're rooted in the Third World Liberation Front student strike that happened in 1969, which was a coalition of Asian American Chicano, Native, and Black students. Um, so we wrote a statement and I'll just read a, a short excerpt from that. So the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies Library stands at the movement for Black lives and its goal to win rights recognition and resources for Black people. Founded in third world solidarity with the struggle for Black studies, the Ethnic Studies Library recognizes and affirms that until Black lives and power matter, no communities of color are truly free. Our hearts are with the families currently grieving and the generations of families who've mourned the loss of their loved ones at the hands of the police, and I would add racial terror. We move in solidarity with black communities in this country and globally who experience daily the violence of racism and white supremacy. Sit in this chair, will you? We affirm the demands to defund and divest from institutions and cultures of policing and prisons and reinvest in community control over its own safety and well-being. 
The disproportionate impact of the coronavirus pandemic along racial lines is a current manifestation of a world designed and architected by white supremacy and anti-blackness. Communities of color, particularly black communities, suffer and resist the combined oppression of living under healthcare, economic, and ecological systems designed for profit rather than for human dignity. So that's a short um, uh, excerpt from it. We don't want to read the whole statement because that would be all would fall asleep and we have much more exciting things to talk about. But we did want to start with that also because our library is rooted in solidarity. Um, both building within our communities, um, you know, the Asian American community is very diverse, broad, a lot of different issues, but also building solidarity with each other for this larger goal of getting free, being free from racial injustice. So I'm really excited to be here and to learn from, from John and Patricia. And I have to say, I completely devoured the book in two days. So thank you so much. All right, perfect. Thank you, Sina, for your uh, introduction. Um, and now I guess we'll, we can get right to it. I'd also like to quickly remind everyone, thank you for muting, um, but when we get to our conversation portion of the program, um, we ask that you also turn off your video so that we can uh, focus on John and Patricia for the conversation part. Um, so speaking of that, I'd like to introduce John Tateishi and Patricia Wakita. Uh, so John was born in Los Angeles and he was incarcerated from ages three to six at Manzanar, one of America's 10 World War II concentration camps. Uh, he played an important role in leading the campaign for Japanese American redress and as the JACL director. He used the lessons of the campaign to help ensure that the rights of the nations Arab and Muslim communities were protected after 9-11. Uh, he's also the author of Redress, uh, the book that Sina mentioned reading. Um, yes. And Patricia Wakita is a fourth generation Japanese American artist, writer, and community historian. For the past 15 years, she's worked with numerous cultural institutions, such as the Japanese American National Museum, Discover Nikkei, the Oakland Museum of California, and the Densho Encyclopedia project. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome John and Patricia to get started. Patricia, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Let's start that all over again. I just wanted to start by thanking East Wind for bringing us all together. Um, I I was so excited that this book was coming out. I heard about it maybe a year and a half ago when it was in production at Heyday. Um, I'm very fortunate that I um, am part of the Heyday family and have been for a long time. And I'm so glad that John's book is out and available to people um, to read because as a Yonsei, as a fourth generation, I really didn't have very much knowledge about this history. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at primary sources on World War II and what happened immediately after the American concentration camps, but I had very little knowledge of the details of what went on behind the scenes. And this is what John is able to bring to us. Um, I also wanted to mention quickly about Heyday that when I worked for Heyday Books, we were just upstairs from East Wind um, Bookstore. So I could actually walk downstairs for lunch or even coming into work or leaving work and see wave at B and Harvey through the window there. So they've really been at the heart of our community forever and always um, supported our books with readings and putting books in the window and just being really great friends. Um, so I really, really do appreciate everything that they do. Um, so when I uh, was working at Heyday Books, I put together a book with my friend Lhasa Ninata called Only What We Could Carry, which is a compilation and anthology of writings that happened during um, the incarceration period, which is roughly 1941 to 45. And I had read another book that John had put together on oral histories about camp. And it was my introduction to John's work and to these oral histories of people talking about their firsthand experiences um, of what had happened. I didn't meet him until maybe two years ago, and um, I'm really pleased to be 
in conversation with him. And I really would like today's presentation to be a talk about what he had learned, um, what he witnessed, and how he actually sees those lessons playing out today, particularly in 2020, as we're seeing history being made and changes in, in the air around how we might be able to address racial injustice um, on, that, on that high national level. So to begin, I wanted to ask John just to even tell me a little bit more about the book and for people who aren't familiar with redress, tell us what is redress than when we say that word um, in context of the Japanese Americans and what were some of the outcomes? Well, I, I'm assuming everyone who's tuned in knows about the incarceration during World War II. If there's someone who, who doesn't know the facts, uh, let me just say that when the war broke out uh, against Japan, um, 1940, the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, within three months, the mechanisms of government were rolling to, to um, remove us from the West Coast. This is something that was already planned. It was planned long before uh, Pearl Harbor. And what happened was that Japanese Americans, every person of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast, was forced from their homes, put into these concentration camps. Um, there were no trials, no hearings, very few, but they were like kangaroo court hearings. So essentially we had no due process. Three years in these prisons, and then we returned to our communities, uh, each family given 25 bucks. And we returned to our communities wherever we wanted to go. And, um, then for 30 years, we remained silent about what happened to us. You saw some of the testimony at the Los Angeles Commission hearing. People could not talk about, the Nisei could not talk about the wartime experience because there was so much a sense of shame. And it was in the late 1960s that some street activists in Los Angeles, Sansei, started talking about camp and the need to rectify whatever had happened. But the information was really vague at that point because Japanese Americans didn't know a lot about our own experience other than what we experienced personally. And that started evolving as an issue among Sanseis because the Nisei didn't want to talk. And they kept silent about camp. And uh, it evolved into this campaign. The JACL, the organization I worked with, um, was really set up to do this kind of a thing. The JACL is a national civil rights organization. Chapters around the country, has a structure, has a Washington office. So we were really prepared for something like this, although not for the magnitude of what this became. For us, the discussion was really about what to do about what happened to us. We were talking about reparations in the initial stages of this within the JCL. That evolved into this idea of redress, which was a much broader, much more altruistic, and much more, in a sense, politically realistic way to approach what we were seeking. And redress became the the name of what this campaign was all about, redress being to seek ways to remedy what had happened to us, uh, which would include an apology and reparations, direct payment to those who were victimized by the government's actions. So we talked about this either as redress or reparations, but you know, the language changed as the movement evolved. It started out at a point where most of us refer to that experience as the evacuation or the relocation. We talked about camp and we, you know, we could only do what we knew. We could only work in the issue by what we understood about what happened to us. And at the beginning, what that reflected is we had no idea what had occurred. And little by little, we started picking up information. And that a breakthrough was a book by a woman named Michi Weglin, Years of Infamy, which was really the first expose on the experience of Japanese Americans. So from that point, it became a movement where the community 
argue the, the issue a lot of the a lot of the Nisei did not want us to touch this. It was driven by the Sansei, but mainly because the Sansei wanted to understand what happened because they had no idea what had happened because their parents hadn't talked to them about what happened in camp. And when the Sansei would ask, the, their parents would get really angry and just basically say, you know, just leave it alone, shikatakanai. And so this was a Sansei driven issue at the beginning but it was an issue that would not have worked without the Nisei voice involved. And so as we developed the, the campaign within the JACL, it was basically a program, a program to codify and, and try to formulate a way to move forward with this so we could have the conversation within the community. I don't think anyone was talking at that point about catharsis or rectifying the wrong I mean, our goals were so, so unknown even to us. I mean, we were talking about doing something about it. I mean, that's basically where this all started. And as we evolved within the JSL, as we evolved the issue, it started taking shape and money became part of the discussion. That became a really important part of what we were trying to deal with. So this, you know, it, it's, started as a kind of amorphous movement because we didn't know how to shape it, but it did become a national movement. The entire Japanese American community got involved with this. And it was something that reached the level that uh, was actually pretty phenomenal in the short period of time uh, that we pushed this issue from a community discussion where mainstream newspapers and media really didn't care. Um, they couldn't be bothered with what we were demanding. But as soon as we named a monetary figure, it became an important issue because then there was the reaction against us. And so what we were trying to do was bring this issue to the attention of the American public and to try to have a national conversation about what had happened to us and how we had to do whatever we could to ensure it wouldn't happen, <clears throat> excuse me, that it wouldn't happen again in the future. So that was what redress became. Right. And what were some of those important outcomes at the very end? I know I'm really speeding through so much of the process, which is what the book is about. And I absolutely encourage people to read the book because there's so many details but tell, tell us what, what came at the end of the commission's findings and what were the recommendations and what happened so people know. Well, we, the JSL adopted a strategy to have a commission established to investigate and to hold hearings. Um, you try to bring the information together and a lot of it had to be the personal experiences of Japanese Americans. So um, what, what we did was push for this commission strategy. And um, we had the hearings. The commission, after a year of investigation, came out with a report that said that it, the experiences that we went through, the treatment of Japanese Americans was unwarranted. Um, it was unconstitutional, basically that it was wrong. Um, and it was a 400 page report, which, was accompanied six months later with a recommendation of remedies um, by the commission. It included $20,000 uh, and the creation of a trust fund. And um, we, the, what happened with the JSL is because that was the strategy we, we decided to pursue. We said, we'll go with whatever the commission comes out with. If they say it was justified you know, and we said, yeah, okay, we'll listen to that and we'll accept it, knowing them all. They, there was no way they could come out with that kind of a conclusion. But it was the money amount that became an issue. And so when, and we had these discussions, these debates with them. When they came out with a $20,000 figure, that became the figure that the Japanese American community accepted. And that became the legislation. And for Another three years, we fought to get that, that amount of a, a bill with a 20,000 and an apology 
and the uh, trust fund, we pushed to get a bill through and it was called the Civil Liberties Act. And it was passed and signed by President Reagan, Ronald Reagan of all people, um, signed the bill in 1988. The result of that was that every person who was still alive um, and had experienced or were victims of uh, the government's orders during the war received an apology, letter of apology, and a check for $20,000. That was really unprecedented. The United States doesn't ever apologize for wrongs it commits. Sure. It doesn't give you, it doesn't pay reparations. It's just not a policy of the government. So this is all new territory for us as we were trying to figure out how we we're going to do this. So once Reagan signed the bill and it became law, then it was a process. Um, you know, there had to be a lot of administrative work involved, but there was a process by which first the Issei got paid their 20,000. They received the letter and checks. And then the older Nisei, and finally those of us who were children in the camps were the last ones to get the letter and uh, the check. What that did though was much more than what we talked about, our experience. It put the country on notice that they could no longer do this. That in the future, if the United States government ever tried to do this again with American citizens, then there would be a consequence that would be they would have to pay. And I, you know, I, I, and, and the perfect example and the tragedy was after 9-11. Because we had pushed this campaign through, I'm absolutely convinced, because I was working with members of Congress after 9-11, that had we not pushed redress, that there would be, there was very much a real chance that the Congress would have enacted legislation to round up every uh, Arab and Muslim in the United States. I would tell them, look, there are 120,000 of us in 1942. And 30, 40 years later, it costs this government over $2 billion in reparations. We're looking at a community of anywhere from three to five to maybe more millions. And I, I would say there's not enough money in the US Treasury to sure. pay reparations because this is exactly right. what you're doing. You're doing exactly to them well, what was and happening. I, and I agree that the most important and exciting part of, of the redress success is that it created a precedent for other campaigns or other possibilities if there are wrongdoings of similar levels on a national, you know, for the nation. And I know that we've talked about this personally and we've even discussed this a little bit with East Wind staff that um, you know, what if there were a new redress movement to, let's say, protect the, to um, defend and support the families of people who um, are lost in police violence or even for reparations for people who have been enslaved um, throughout the United States. I'm curious just to hear your opinions about power within a community today, like looking at what's happening now or looking and looking back at the past, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, where does the power, how does the community build and leverage power in these kinds of cases? How did it work for you? And it's kind of amazing, like you said, with the size of the Japanese American community, how much got done? Do you have any insights on like what might, what were the important things that got the community to rise up and make this actually happen? Well, you know, for Japanese Americans, it was, a lot of it had to do with vindication. We had been labeled traitors during World War II. I mean, I, I can't think of a worse thing to be labeled during time of war than to be accused of betraying your own country and being traitors to the country. So for the Nisei, that was part of the shame. So as we started evolving this whole campaign, what occurred to me was that the Nisei don't care about the money. I mean, anytime we would bring money up, they would get really pissed off at us and say, this is disgraceful. We do not do that. You know, we're a proud culture. But if you talk to them about rectifying the wrong to prevent it from happening again, that's what resonated with Anise, this altruistic sense 
that we have something to contribute to the country. Maybe, you know, for the last time, we can make a contribution that's really meaningful. That's what turns so many of the Nisei around to start talking about uh, what happened to them personally, because they wanted that to be part of the legacy that would lead to this prevention of this kind of action in the future. So when you look at what we were able to accomplish and it's something so unprecedented, um, the natural question then to ask is, what about black reparations, for example? After redress was done, um, I was invited to speak at some conferences of African Americans seeking reparations or ways to find reparations. Really key to our whole success was this commission concept. That strategy was really critical. Had we not been able to do that, I think we would still be fighting to get reparations. But because we adopted a strategy that worked simply because it educated the public about what we went through and because it convinced the Congress that what happened was wrong, the talk about how Japanese Americans work that strategy had little relevance to black reparations, to that movement. And, but you know, in the past few weeks, I thought, I know there's been a bill, HR 40, that was there right. before HR we started. 40. John Conyers had HR 40 before uh, I ever got involved with redress. So I went to see him. He was one of the first guys I went to see in Congress. And he says, you know, I'm going to support it, but I want you to know HR 40 is really important to this country. And so as I thought about this over a long period of time, years of this, how do, you, how do African Americans move this issue? And I, I've got to tell you, since the killing of George Floyd, it's changed everything. And where before I used to think, there's not a chance in hell. I mean, especially given this president and this Congress, there's no way in hell you can get any kind of a bill moving. But you know, the idea of a commission suddenly to me has real relevance to what African-Americans are seeking. I don't think Americans, I mean, you know, I look at the reaction to, the, to what happened to George Floyd, this kind of awful slow motion death eight minutes of watching this video, it's horrifying. That really changed America, I think. And that's why I think there's been so much uh, activity going on by non-African Americans. I mean, this, these aren't black Americans who are out there pro protesting. You see a lot of uh, whites, a lot of mainstream people out there in those protest marches. I think right now, what a commission can do for uh, the black reparations movement is to describe exactly how this has affected the communities, the black community, and what it's done in such a devastating way. Because, you know, we talk about slavery as horrible, the inhumanity of it. But honestly, I think we keep it abstract. But when you see a black person laying there, begging to, to, for his life, and this cop just sits there, it suddenly changes the whole equation, in my view, that suddenly we understand something about black men getting killed on the streets for doing nothing but being black. And I think that's the function a commission can serve now, where I don't know if it really did have a relevant function Mm -hmm. to make that movement get legs to it. I, right. you know, it's quite honestly, for the first time, I think there's a real possibility if they can work that commission the right way. Right. I think I have just, the, I'm just going to interrupt and say, I have time for one more question because I really want to open this up to our audience to ask their questions as well. Um, of course, I have so many other questions for you, John. Um, yeah, really big. But questions. I really do. I have lots of big questions. But I'm going to I'm going to end my question session with this a question about timing with the redress movement. So we know that there were many years between the closing of the camps and people having to reestablish their lives before this whole campaign got off the ground. How do you think timing affected that whole process? And 
I'm just kind of curious about for again building similar redress reparations campaigns. How important was it to have living, you know, living survivors with their testimony at the CWRC hearings and to tell you about the violence, to tell you about the sorrow and the loss. In some cases, you may not have those people in other other campaigns. What do you think? Oh, I think that was critical for us. I mean, there's no question that having survivors, direct victims of that experience was really important. It was critical. Did you but, see you know, patterns, any chance? I'm curious, like, did you notice things that people were saying over and over? Oh, or? they were saying over and over, the, the sense of betrayal, how, how much it hurt them as Americans having to understand that this government, government just didn't give a damn about them. Mm -hmm. You know, they were just being tossed aside. And that really was devastating for the Nisei. They were bewildered, they were scared, they didn't know what was gonna happen. Some thought they were gonna be deported. And you know, it was so, there was so much confusion. But the fact that 30, 40 years later, we had living survivors that went through the experience and um, one of the things we had to do was say, okay, we will not agree to an heirs uh, clause in the, the legislation. This will only be for those who are still alive. Obviously, you can't do that with black reparations, but you have people who are going through the horrible experience of being black in America today. I mean, you know, we're seeing it over and over now, and it's becoming convincing. There's never a good time for it. I mean, redress should have happened early, but earlier, but it didn't. And it, we did it at the worst possible time when we were in this ferocious trade war with Japan. And Democrats were against Japan and the trade issue. Republicans wanted an, an open market. Reagan, you know, it was really screwy. The timing was horrible, but we were there. And if you're there, you just have to do it. Keep in mind that Johnson, President Johnson had the Great Society, Great American Society program, pumped millions and millions of dollars into essentially four black communities. I think what we learned from that is you can't just dump money into a community and say, okay, it's fine. Now you're good. You know, all the past is forgiven. There's got to be something really meaningful. And I think if you today, I think today is the perfect time for it, as awful as things are. Sure. It's the awfulness that white America is suddenly starting to understand. You know, it's easy to say, yeah, it's really terrible what blacks go through, without really understanding what that is until they see that video. And suddenly the country has changed. I mean, from the very beginning, it felt like this was very different. So sure. I think right now is the time they need to push this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a little concerned that a lot of the reaction also has to do with shame. You know, when other people are watching this video, they feel the shame that is part of the, the political push and pull of how to make people understand where you're coming from. And I think that we've talked, you and I have talked too about what a big and important educational program this was, right? It was for, yeah. it was for the Japanese Americans as well as for the nation. Um, and I do think that that is something that we're going through collectively right now, which is educating ourselves. Um, however, I'm not sure if the messages are being coalesced the way that the redress movement was able to put them into succinct bullet points towards the end. Well, okay. you know, at the time we were really naive politically. Hmm. Um, African Americans are so far ahead of us now politically. Uh, you know, they're, they're, really, they're really very skillful at politics in America. So they'll figure that out. Right. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Songvi um, with East Wind to start bringing in people's questions. Um, again, I, I had like a list of questions I never got to, but it's good because I still just, I'm still so excited to hear what everyone else has to ask. Yes, thank you, Patricia and John. Um, so we do have some questions coming in and our first one is, um, what are the specifics behind John, your uh, statement that the incarceration of Japanese was planned before Pearl Harbor? Well, if you look at, go to the National Archives, look at the collections of um, dec documents between um, government agencies and, and people in the government, you see them talking about 
if we need to make a movement. They don't ever say if we have to move Japanese Americans. They talk about in the event of tensions in the Pacific and we need to remove a body of people, how do we go about it? They're talking about exactly what happened to us. So, I mean, you, you can look as far back, I think it was 1938 when I saw the first government document where I saw something like that. My reaction was, holy crap, they really were talking about this long before Pearl Harbor. So there, there's adequate information in the National Archives. Mm. Next. Thanks. Yes, thanks for that resource, John. Um, so we have another question regarding some of the organizing groups. So besides the JACL, there's other groups like NCRR, um, NCJAR, and the Karam Nobis legal teams. So what, do, what role do you think they played in the redress movement? Well, you know, I think in the end, everyone, all the groups played a role. I think the entire community came together. Um, quite honestly, during the campaign, um, there was a lot of there was a lot of conflict. I mean, even within the JECL, and I described him described this in my book. There was conflict within the JECL from the very beginning, but the JECL, because it it was the organization best suited to try to move a campaign, was the organization that became the focal point of uh, redress as a movement. And we had the connections in Washington, we had offices around the country, we had chapters, et cetera. But other organizations were doing other things. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know everything or most of what was going on because, um, you know, we didn't share a lot of information. We got into these, these battles within the community and uh, I wasn't kept informed of what was happening out there. Um, my focus was directly on Washington and how to, how to educate the American public. I mean, you know, this is, it's like a, a hope or a pipe dream. How do you educate the American public about what happened to us? A group that was considered insignificant and actually really hated. And to try to convince them that what, what happened was wrong and that we're American citizens, we didn't deserve it, and we are going to demand some way to rectify this. So, you know, this is what I was trying to work on. There were other things going on in the community, um, and I know there were rallies and various kinds of meetings taking place. I just wasn't involved in any of that. And um, as I say in my book, I only talk about the stuff I knew was going on. Uh, and that was mainly what I was involved in. NCJAR, that lawsuit, I, I have to tell you, was a complete surprise to us. And uh, it was, it created some, it was interesting, some ripples in Washington um, among the Japanese American members because they thought, holy cow, is this thing's right at a bad point in our whole strategy. And it was, you know, it was something that actually worked to our advantage because the difference between our $20,000 demand and Bill Horry's massive uh, uh, lawsuit was, I mean, we're talking differences of magnitudes members of Congress didn't want to even talk about. You talk about a $20,000 reparations bill and you talk about something that's over basically over $2 billion for this other bill. Um, and, you know, if you have $200,000 per person for the class, it comes out to a, a pretty hefty sum. So that's, you know, for me, that's how I used it. I thought, okay, uh, you, and, and members of Congress would say this to me, well, you know, there's this NC JAR lawsuit. I want to wait to see what happens. And I would say, okay, that's fine. I hope the bill, I mean, that lawsuit succeeds because it's a hell of a lot more money than what we're demanding. And you'd be better off to go with our bill um, before that lawsuit is settled in court. And I, you know, I would lay out, lay out the arguments and say, 
I don't know how a court can reject a lawsuit. The evidence is so obvious. But you know, to answer your question, there, was, there were a lot of things. The whole community got involved. I just don't know. Um, I don't know what all everyone was doing or what all the organizations were doing. Um, and I guess you just have to read everyone's books on those. Um, yes, in terms of, oh, I'm unmuted now, okay. Uh, in terms of books and reading, um, we do have a question about um, you telling your story. So uh, I think this is question is from Sina at the library. There's lots of archives about the Japanese American movement, uh, but it's different to hear it from someone who has lived through it. So how did you choose to tell the story from your, your perspective? Um, and how did you choose what to share and what not to share in your book? Well, you know, I, I decided to do this as a first person narrator. Um, mainly because there, I couldn't fill in all the gaps of everything going on in the community. Um, Mitch Maki wrote a book that, that describes a lot of the other stuff. There's a lot of data there that's useful. I wanted to talk about what it took to get this campaign from the point that I entered it and all the tumultuous disagreements between uh, J cell chapters and members and the J cell and the community and the community split on issues. And I, you know, so I, what I decided was I can't talk about what other people were doing because I didn't really know what they were doing, but I can, what I wanted to do was describe what we were trying to do within the JACL and the confrontations we had to deal with and what it took to get this thing from a conversation point into a campaign and a movement and to try to spread this around the country and reach farther than we had arms could reach um you know we're a small community we were at that time six hundred and fifty thousand japanese americans the jacl had i think twenty four thousand members half the members didn't agree with this campaign so you're talking about within the JSL, maybe 12,000 people working on this in an affirmative way. And the other 12,000 telling us to go to hell, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this. And the same thing is reflected in the community. So, you know, I couldn't talk about all those other things. And the, I decided I, I needed to tell this from my perspective, what I went through and to describe what that was all about and how we as an organization move this issue from point to point. Another question? Yes, great. So we have a few questions regarding um, Japanese Americans being satisfied with the Civil Liberties Act. Do you think they were satisfied? Um, and do you feel the monetary aspect of the act could be applied to benefit the African-American community? You know, throughout the campaign, I used to do a lot of, uh, a lot of speeches all over the country. And I, I, would, I would accept an invitation from just about any group, non-Japanese American group, because I was trying to get our story out there. So I would say over and over, it's not the money. The money isn't important to us. It's what the Congress does in acknowledging the wrong that was committed. And you know, in my mind, it was about the Nisei. I mean, this whole campaign to me from the very beginning was about the Nisei, the vindication of everything they believed in as Americans. And so that was fundamental to how I moved from decision to decision, what would get the Nisei involved. But I kept saying the money isn't important. Personally, I thought the money was important because it was a statement. We needed to demand the money. I was one of the advocates for compensation, but I also was an advocate for the, the broader goals of this thing. And, you know, when it was all said and done, I was more right than I really understood because the money really didn't matter to the Nisei. 
Most of them put the money into educational accounts for their grandkids. They gave um, whole checks to Janum to build this monument to our history. And they gave money to the churches, to nonprofit organizations. All, a lot of the community organizations benefited from the money. But most Nisei really didn't care much about the money. And, um, you know, it was really kind of a, an amazing thing to observe. And um, the money that we got was symbolic. I mean, 20,000 bucks for three years imprisonment and worse, being labeled as traitors to the country. Money is really important in anything you do legislatively to rectify a wrong. And I don't know how the black reparations movement will come up with a figure. Ours was literally, a, we tossed numbers out there and we grabbed it out of the air. Ours was JSL 25,000. Uh, the commission deliberated on how much they were gonna do. Um, but I think for black America, the money is extremely important because it partly it'll help heal some of the wounds and it'll be a statement that the legacy they've inherited and can continue to live needs to change and this is a way to start making that change you know it's whatever they get is only going to be a first step it's a long long and i think very painful process for them to go through. Um, we were fortunate we, we, could, we could really define when we could start and when we could end this. And uh, you know, I would like to have done it faster to get money to the Issei because the Issei really suffered. But there's just no way we could have moved that, that kind of a legislation. I think in this case, because there are no survivors, direct survivors of slavery, it's a question of the legacy that black America has inherited and the racism that continues as a result of that legacy. That's, I think that's what needs to change. And that's what that kind of, of legislation can address. Great. And on that note, uh, supporting the black communities. How can we as Asian Americans support the fight for justice for black communities? Well, you know, I, I think that's an individual question that we each have to ask in whatever ways we can contribute to uh, whatever they're attempting to do. I don't know if we have the sophistication of the black community. Uh, we were miles ahead of where we were when we started Redress, but it, it's up to organizations in the community and those who want to participate to join those organizations for Asian American organizations to commit to contributing whatever they can to the struggle for equality for Black Americans. Um, it's a tough fight. You know, racism is a really, really um, difficult issue to deal with. In my time with the JSL, I spent, in the end, I spent about 15 years uh, with JSL. It was always dealing with racism and it's difficult, it's endless. And, and you know, it's worse now than it was five years ago. And there's, that means there's like 10 times more effort that needs to go into rectifying um, all the things that have gone wrong. We're in for, our, we have to be in there for a long haul and commit to be supportive of whatever um, the black leadership wants from us. But you know, it's gotta be organizational and individuals uh, wanting to contribute. And I think we can contribute. Great. Um, all right, we have a few more questions. Um, glad we have time for them, though. Uh, who or what do you think made it possible to pass redress under the conservative Reagan administration, especially considering it also had monetary reparations? You know, the key for us we, was that when we started this, we had three Japanese American members of Congress who were extremely 
respected. Um, Danny Noe was, you couldn't get much better than Danny Noe. Um, he was a veteran. He was a war hero. He sat on all kinds of major committees, uh, was liked by most of his colleagues. And then Spark, Spark Matsunaga, who was a, just an amazing workhorse in the Senate, um, he's the guy who pushed most of the legislation around uh, for redress. And then Norm Mineta, most people don't remember, but Norm was still fairly new to the House. He'd only been there for a few years, but even at that point, he was already being talked about as possibly a future Speaker of the House. And not many members ever are seen that way. But there was talk of Norm Mineta as a future Speaker of the House of Representatives. And, you know, I mean, everyone knows how his career ended up. I mean, this, he had one of the most distinguished careers of any member who'd gone, in, gone through the House. Bob Matsui was new. He had just gotten elected when we started this campaign in the Congress. But, you know, Bob was a workhorse. He's a guy who um, made up his mind that he was going to be important and was very ambitious politically, which worked to our favor. And, excuse me, so the fact that we had those four, and it's not just that they were there, but because of their positions, they were really well connected to the leadership. You know, among the Democrats, um, these, mainly the three who were the veterans of, of the Congress had such good connections. You know, we could, we could go to Norm and ask him to talk to the speaker or talk to the majority leader, or we could go to both Sparky and, and uh, Inouye and see if they could talk to the leadership of the Republican Party for us. And that helped an awful lot. In the end, it was all about votes. And uh, we got lucky in a lot of different ways. Uh, but, you know, it took a lot of work. The JSL, over the period of its involvement, spent over a million dollars on the campaign. And it was committed to getting this done. And uh, it was bringing the community together, ultimately, that helped push the legislation. That was important because a member of Congress who hears the community is really divided on this issue always has a way out. But once the community came together after the commission, then it was a solid front. And here we had four, four guys in there who were really pushing hard for us. That was key. Great. So I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and also Patricia, if you'd like to share any of your thoughts on any of the questions we've already answered in this question as well, feel free to do that. Um, but we have, how did the JACL come to determine the parameters of who would receive the reparations? This person's also thinking about the Japanese Latin Americans who were also interned in the US. Um, I talk about the JLAs in my book and um, you know, it's still a point of criticism that there was a decision we made because um, one thing I encountered were, keep in mind, in, in those days, almost every member of Congress was a practicing lawyer. Um, they, were, they all had law degrees. So they knew a lot about the history from a legal perspective. And so our argument was it was unconstitutional. It was a violation of our rights as uh, American citizens and um, legal residents, meaning the Issei. So as I was lobbying, I started getting this, this pushback from Republicans saying, oh, but you guys weren't all citizens. I mean, there were those who were um, not American citizens. I was thinking, okay, they're talking about the, the Issei who were forbidden by law from becoming American citizens until after the war. So I say, I would tell them that. And they say, no, 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 we're talking about, you had a bunch of people down from uh, Mexico and South America, and you know, they were talking about the JLAs. And as much as you could argue that point that they were kidnapped and their treatment was worse than ours, um, 
There, nevertheless, they would say, but this bill is for American citizens and uh, legal resident aliens. So that became a, a real blocking point for us. And Danny Nori was the first one I saw. Uh, I was going through the Senate and I ran into him and he, he said, you know, there's a problem. Same thing happened on the House side, Norm and Bob, and uh, we talked about this. And so we sat and made a decision that if we, if we include, continue to include the JLAs, it was going to, to jeopardize the bill. And there was this whole issue of for the greater good. And I know people say, well, yeah, you know, that's just bullshit. Well, it was very real. And I agreed with the decision to take the JLAs out of the bill until a later point. Um, because to me, the commitment was to get redress passed. Once we got redress passed for, for all of us, we could come right on the heels of that and push a second bill through. We had a commitment from Inor, Matsunaga, Mineta, and Matsui that they would join on that. And so I wasn't there by the end. I mean, the last two and a half years, I was gone. I left the campaign because we had a lot of internal conflict at, in the JSL. The, J, the JSL's component group, LEC, pushed the final two years. They did a hell of a job. And uh, the LEC controlled the JSL. And it wasn't until 10 years later, I was approached to ask about um, the JLA issue. And quite honestly, I was surprised because that was a we made. And the board knew about it, that we were pulling the JLAs out uh, because they were jeopardizing the bill. And there were, we thought at that point, 60,000, turns out 80,000 JAs um, whose bill would have been jeopardized. And so balance that against the numbers of Japanese Latin Americans. It was a really crappy deal, but that was the best we could do. And I was, Honestly, I was comfortable with it thinking, we get the, the main bill through, we come right on the heels of that with another bill for JLAs, and how could they not say yes when that situation was worse? That second bill never was uh, proposed by the JSL. So as an organization, we failed on that. Um, and you know, the result of that was the lawsuit, that the Mochizuki lawsuit that came 10 years after the redress bill passed. Oh, to answer part of that question, the definition of eligibility was anyone who was living in the military zone at the beginning of the war and affected by the government's orders, starting with 9066 and every subsequent order that put us, that forced us from our homes, put us into these prisons. So it was the incarceration and the orders that led us to that, um, that defined who would be eligible. And, you know, we, we included everyone. We included those who were in the military zone because there were the so-called volunteer evacuees, those who escaped the sort of the, the net that the army put around us. They got out early. Um, so for them, they had to be included, now, partly because my father-in-law was one of them. And um, he said, you know, remember, it was pretty crappy for us out there. And, he, you know, I had heard his stories about how difficult it was for the volunteer evacuees and other people who had been those so-called volunteers. Uh, life was really hard for them. So the only way to, to include everybody was to say anyone who was living in the, the zone, the military zone at the beginning, because every group said to me, you cannot include, like the vets would say, you can't include the no-no boys, you can't include the, uh, the resistors. And uh, some of, I actually had some uh, no-no boys say, you can't include the, the people who uh, expatriated. 
because we stuck it out at Thule and they went. Everybody had a crappy deal. And, you know, none of this would have happened if the government hadn't done this to us. Perfect, great. Thank you so much, John, and also Patricia. Um, I know there were a lot of questions still in the chat, and if there are a few that we didn't get to, please keep sending them into the chat or email us, and we will have John and Patricia get back to you. So don't worry if your questions weren't answered. Um, so thank you again to John and Patricia for joining us. We hope everyone learned something. I know that uh, Japanese reparations and reparations like John and Patricia's that is super relevant to what's happening today in our world. Um, so please keep sharing your thoughts and reading and educating. If you enjoyed our chat today, visit us at Eastwind Books. You can purchase a copy of John's book. It's, it's autographed, which is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> John stopped by the store to autograph all of our books, which was super sweet. And it's also 10% off. Uh, it's hardback and they're expensive sometimes so it's 10% off we also have Patricia's only what you could we could carry um, that she helped to edit and put together also at 10% off so check us out at asiabookcenter.com if you'd like to pick up a coffee we do curbside pickup um, and we are also shipping books to you if you'd like to receive them in the mail as well so thanks, John and Patricia and Sina from the Ethnic Studies Library and also everyone at the Eastwind team for all of your hard work to put this together. <laughs>